and welcome to how to build lizardmen armies. The main strengths of the lizardmen are that they of course have extremely powerful dinosaurs in their armies. This gives them a strong monstrous presence on the battlefield that a lot of factions can't match. They're also tanky overall with most units having high HP and armor and almost all units are powerful in melee even those that are ranged. For the weaknesses though they are overall quite slow compared to similar units of the same type. The non-explosive ranged units are also fairly limited in damage if you're not playing particular factions and on the whole the faction tends to be quite expensive. First of all we'll start in the early game. In tier 0 we have the Croxgar Ancient, Red Crested Skink Chief, Saurus Allblood, Slan Mage Priests, Skink Cohorts and Skink Cohorts with Javelins. In tier 1 we have Skink Skirmishers, Red Crested Skinks and Feral Cold Ones. Now for our early game composition most of the Lord choices here have their strengths and weaknesses. The Croxgar Ancient is the strongest right out the gate but doesn't have much scaling. The Red Crested Skink is the cheapest but isn't really that powerful. The Saurus Allblood starts out fairly decent but has very good scaling into the late game with mounts and of course the slan mage priests have the most power potential but you do need to have recruited 20 units before you can get one and they also take a little bit of time to get online it also depends on your hero choice a bit later on so either go with the saurus old blood or the slan mage priests and we'll come to the hero choices later the saurus old blood they'll be decent right out of the gate helping out those front lines the slan mage priest won't be too much use yet but once they get some spells on the go they'll be much better the rest of the army we're gonna go with six red crested skinks for the front lines these have nice armor piercing damage but are a little bit squishy so you're gonna make sure they're going against something they can kill fast to avoid taking too much damage. We're also going to take seven Skink Javelin Cohorts. These are a nice flanking unit that can use their ranged barrages to burst down less armored enemies before going into melee combat. You sure want to use these as a flanking unit to charge into the enemy backs since they aren't the highest damage for proper front lines battling. Finally, we're taking six Feral Cold Ones. These are speedy pseudo cav units that will be handling taking out the enemy back lines to keep the rest of your units safe. They do tend to go on a rampage quite easily, so it's best to send them around in groups to burst enemies down before they can get out of control. The strengths of this army is it's fairly speedy since skinks have a high speed for infantry and of course the cold ones will be getting around the battlefield at rapid pace. The only thing that's slow here is lords. There is also quite a nice bit of poison damage both in the front lines and in the javelin cohorts which gives you a nice boost in the early game. Both lords here are also great choices and will beat similar lords of the same type from other factions. As for the weaknesses of this army, pretty low leadership on the whole since skinks don't have the most confidence and will retreat before long. It's also not the toughest army in the world, skinks and feral cold ones are not known for their armor and their tough line holding capabilities so they will get killed quite quickly. The lines also don't really have any weight to them so if the enemy has any high mass units they can more or less walk straight through them. For the mid game we have access to tier 2 units, chameleon stalkers, chameleon skinks, skink chiefs, saurus spears, saurus warriors, pterodon riders, pterodon riders with fire leech bowlers, and the Feral Bastilodon. Tier 3 units like the Sacred Croxigore, Croxigores, the Shielded Saurus Spears, the Shield of Saurus Warriors, Cold One Spear Riders, Cold One Riders, Horned Ones, Salamander Hunting Packs, Raised On Hunting Packs, Skink Priests, Feral Stegodons, Revivification Crystal Bastilodons, Soul Engine Bastilodons, and Ark of Sotic Bastilodons. For our mid game composition, of course, we're going to be leading them with either the Saurus Old Blood or the Slan Mage. The Saurus will be coming online and getting ready to get on that Carnosaur mount as soon as it's unlocked. And the Slan should have a few spells unlocked and be providing utility on the battlefield. Now, if you're going with the Saurus Old Blood, you're going to want to pick up a Skink Priest here, probably of heaven since that's the better law out of the two choices that you get and just start sinking points into their spell lines and of course waiting for that engine of the gods mount. If you're playing the slan however then we're not picking up any heroes just yet. The front lines are upgrading to six shielded saurus spears which are a great front lines holder with superior defense to warriors. They have slightly less damage but the defense trade-off is well worth it for better line holding. Going with four sacred croc scores which are great front lines embedded monsters that do great disruption damage and bring some power that the spears are lacking. If you're taking the saurus old blood and the caster then you're only bringing four salamander hunting packs, otherwise you're bringing five. These are a brilliant ranged unit that do massive fire range damage and can melt blobs of infantry. They have slightly explosive attacks, so make sure they're getting a good angle rather than firing over your unit's heads to avoid friendly fire. We're going with two Reverification Crystal Bastilodons. These are a great frontline tanky dino with the ability to heal units on a cooldown. They're also great for disrupting the enemy lines and topping up your own unit's HP. We're also going with two Soul Engine Bastilodons. These are great artillery dinos that are also tanks in the front lines. Does great explosive damage that is better suited to single entities since it's just a single entity itself and only fires one shot at a time. The strength of this army is of course we're getting plenty of dinos on the go for lots of tankiness and decent damage outputs. We have slightly fewer ranged units but the damage upgrade coming from them is incredible. And of course we also have a lot of utility with more spells from our lord and of course the crystal. 
vehicles. The weaknesses is we have a lot of large hitboxes. So if the enemy has a lot of ranged units, you're going to get focused down quite a lot. We also don't really have anything that's incredibly quick. So shutting down enemy range can be a bit of a challenge. There are also a lot of possible rampages here. So you need to be careful that units don't get too beaten up and get out of control. Finally, for our late game, we're getting access to tier four units, Temple Guard, Saurus Scar Veterans, Ripodactyl Riders, the Coatles, Ancient Salamanders, Skink Oracles, the Stegodon, and tier five units, the Feral Dread Saurian, the regular Dread Saurian, the Feral Troglodon, Feral Carnosaur, Ancient Stegodon, and Engine of the Gods Ancient Stegodon. Cards for our late game composition, either going with our Slan Mage Priest or the Saurus Old Blood. Slan Mage should be getting more of his spells online now and having a much larger impact on the battle than before. He never gets on a mount, which is a bit sad, but they are still very powerful casters. If you've gone with the Saurus Old Blood, then they should be on their Carnosaur mounts and be absolutely tearing up the battlefield in every single sense of the word. And again, if you've gone with the Slan Mage Priest, you're now going to pick up a Saurus Scar Veteran. This lad will be basically the Saurus Old Blood, but a little bit weaker. And it'll be your character presence in the front lines to reinforce both with damage and leadership. Once he gets leveled up, he'll also get an Akarnasaur mount, which will up his ass kicking capacity by a huge amount. If you've gone with a Saurus Old Blood, then the Skink Priest you picked up earlier will have a lot of their spells unlocked and also be able to pick up a mount like the Engine of the God Stegodon, which will make them into a front lines powerhouse as well as having a ton of utility with the ability of the Engine of the Gods and, of course, the Spellcaster themselves. For our front lines, we're upgrading to Temple Guard. That's not really a question why we'd upgrade to these lads. Best armor and best damage of any infantry in the faction, so it's a no-brainer. We're going with two Feral Troglodons, replacing Ancient Salamanders in my previous compositions, since they have been nerfed so many times. These guys have so much damage, both from a range and in melee, that they are a great choice for single-target snipers. Dropping down to two Salamander Hunting Packs to make room for more powerful units. We're bringing two Engine of the Gods Stegodons. Out of the Stegodons, they really don't have the most range in the game so you don't really have those artillery units but they can help the front lines and of course cast that insane ability to erase anything that can get out of the way. We're bringing two Dread Saurians and I mean they probably aren't the greatest choice because they are expensive as hell and huge hitboxes but I just can't resist. They are such a spectacle to witness and can do a stupid amount of work in battle that is insane. Bringing two Quattles which are beautiful flying units that can cloak anything below them which lets me hide a large amount of my army to protect their advance and basically pull a Dread Saurian out of my ass which is endlessly hilarious. They also provide excellent support with spells as well as a decent amount of combat prowess. Finally, closing us out, we have two Ripidactyl Riders. These lads are here to support the Quattel and hit the enemy back lines with them to make sure those large hitboxes in the faction are kept safe. The strengths of this army is that pretty much everything can hide under the Quattles apart from the Ripidactyl Riders for some extremely bullshit sneaking. There is also a lot of powerful dinos to bowl over the enemy lines with ease, air superiority with the capacity to take out ranged units, and pretty much everything in the army is extremely tanky. The weaknesses, however, a large amount of large hitboxes, so you need to take out ranged units or feel the pain very quickly. Again, it's not the fastest army in the world, aside from the flying units, so it can be quite easy to be kited, but your dinos can still chase down most infantry. Finally, we don't really have any missile units that aren't explosive, so you need to get angles on pretty much every single one of them to avoid a massive amount of friendly fire. Now, to see how this armor performs, I'll pass you over to live commentary, Miles. Take it away. And thank you very much for that, Miles. Now, as you can see, I've uh, slightly changed up my composition, uh, mostly because this one is much more hilarious. The other one, it's a lot easier to see units, but this one, it's, uh, it's just too funny. If you're not aware of the Coatl, has this beautiful little aura that I can't actually show you because uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult. But it's basically this thing, Master of Sacred Places, and every single unit that's in this little aura here is invisible. So effectively, every single unit, apart from my Coatles and my uh, Ripidactyl Riders, is invisible. And I'm just now slowly moving them up to the enemy. And uh, this basically means they can't use all these wonderful range units they have to obliterate my lines before I get there. They won't see me until I'm about here. That's, that's where the stalk tends to run out. Uh, so I'm sending my Ripidactyl Riders around to try and... Uh, flank these cells on rocket batteries but since they're the only well two of the only four units on the map that the enemy can see i'm uh, probably not gonna have too much luck trying to hide from them so let's just speed this up until my lines get into range uh, i've actually uncovered hidden foes for there we go my for my forces if i can actually speak have just been revealed so i'm going to quickly uh, give a massive amount of orders move my temple guard into a well a more useful line than literally just this big old clump here and move my units around hopefully I'm about to give the order any minute now. Oh, my game's nearly crashed. There we go. <laughs> I think it's because I put it on slow motion to like give as many odds as I could in one go, so it kind of freaked the game out a little bit. Yeah, the Ripidactyl Riders are now moving in on the Hellstorm Rocket Battery. They'll do decent there, but since Empire Captain is around and the Demon Rift Knights from Harbour, it's not going to have the best of times. Uh, but nevertheless, I just want to keep those busy while the rest of the main force gets into combat. So as you can see here, there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, the Quattle is moving into the Luminac of Hyde. Stop that from firing. While it's doing that, it has cast the uh, whichever spell it is. Chain Lightning over here, and it's now casting the Ur Uranon's Bolt. Whichever one it is, the Lightning Bolt one, that's getting cast on these Halberdiers to do a little bit of damage there. Similar thing going on over here. The uh, Chain Lightning there, and then the Uranon's Bolt going in on those handgunners. I believe there should also be some Engine of the Gods action. Oh my god, a little bit of friendly fire on the old Dreadsaur in there. Thankfully, those guys have a ridiculous amount of health. There we go. I believe that's an Engine of the Gods coming in now. 
So there's one there, and then another one here into this massive clump of enemies. And then I believe there might also be a burning head from my Slan Mage. The thing with this armor is there are so many abilities to make use of that it can be a little bit overwhelming and you have to play in slow motion a little bit. But if you can make use of all of them, like look at how much of the enemy's forces I've just wiped out in one go. Let's just have a look. Enemy troop count. Yeah, we've obliterated nearly half of their army in that first initial uh, clash of the Titans just there. So uh, yeah, I would say that's a pretty rapid rate for killing. Uh, the Feral Troglodon is firing on these Demogriff Knights of Hobbits. It's about to get charged down. It's going to do some decent damage nonetheless. But these guys, they're not too bad in melee combat, so I'm definitely not worried there. Uh, one thing I really don't like about the Quattles is I feel like their, their melee prowess is really bad. Like, they have decent melee stats and everything. Their damage is all good, but I don't know. It just seems like they never make contact. Oh, my God. Th this is why I'm keeping the Salamander Hunting Packs around. They may not be the most armor-piercing damage in the game, but for stuff like this, ranged infantry and blobs of less armored troops... They can just shred things and just melt them and obliterate their leadership with those fiery attacks. Uh, this big old clump of monsters in the middle here, pretty much everything just taken on the mean tank, so I've decided to reroute the Dread Sorin to chase down the Death Jack Archers, and then this Dread Sorin is going into a two Halberd AD units, but you know what? It's a Dread Sorin. I really doesn't think it matters. It's got 14,000 HP. Of course, we're playing on ultra unit size, but these guys are absolute tanks, and they have so much armor that they can just toss out for this entire battle, which is just absolutely free value there. I love those guys. They might be large hit boxes, but they're still bloody fantastic. Even with all the friendly fire, they're, they're really not feeling too much of a burn. As you can see, just pretty much mopping up, I believe. No, they're just regular great swords. I think there were some caribou great swords somewhere, as there always is. I might have actually taken them out already, which is quite nice. So I can now start to refocus my attention. Pretty much everything's broken on this, so I'm just more or less moving around to take on the final parts of the enemy armies, which is these halberdiers. Uh, these great swords and of course the mean tank which is losing decisively pretty much everything is losing decisively this is just a bit of cleanup i think uh this was uh, definitely one of my my more creative uh battle strategies of stealth my whole unit uh, my whole army up there and honestly if you're using calls i can't recommend it enough it's so funny just like for the enemy to be like oh where's oh there's only four enemy units coming and then all of a sudden two dread sirens appear and all these temple guard and all these highly elite units and it, it's just it's the most bullshit thing you can do outside of uh, the pre-nerf Skaven, uh, Skaven ambush. There we go. We can see another engine of the gods going out to those Gundamans, uh, Showfire handgunners. And that's pretty much it. Everything is shattered. And that is army losses. Yes, I, I'm pretty pleased how I played this one, to be honest. It's uh, a, a lot of the time I say, you know, I could have done this bear, I could have done that bear. I think the only thing that I couldn't have done bear here is uh, probably a bit more micromanaging and make the most of all those builds because there's that bloody many of them. But yes, let's just get straight into the stats. As we can see, only a measly 45 kills on the Slan Mage Priest of Fire. Of course, I go with the Priest of Fire because, you know, I love the lore of fire. It's my favorite lore in the game, so I'm pretty much always going to pick it up. Uh, only 45 kills there was pretty much targeting the uh, enemy ranged unit, so the damage value isn't the most in the world. But again, these guys can't get involved in the front line, so they're mostly there to uh, assist with buffs, debuffs, and of course, beautiful fire magic spells. And you didn't actually see if I did use a couple of... Uh, buffs when there was all your units fighting the enemy lord and hero gave them a couple of defensive and offensive damage buffs to break them down even faster uh, the source scavenger and we didn't actually I, I can't remember where i even sent him to i think i sent him into the big clump of the meme tank so that's probably why his damage his actual kills are very low but his damage value is very decent because he was fighting uh single entities for the majority of that battle so didn't get many kills but the damage value he did do was very high uh, on the temple guard here we have an average of about 20 ish kills i would say yeah, the damage value not out of this world for those guys. Barely any of them. Well, an outlier there with 1,400. The majority of them are in around the 300 mark, which isn't the best in the world. But um, but in an army like this with that many range units and monsters, they are more or less there to just soak up damage and let other things do the damage on them. So I'm completely happy with that. Of course, the Ripidactyl Riders did get taken out quite quickly. Uh, I think I definitely could have used them better. Maybe hold them back until the rest of my army gets into range and starts fighting and then pull them around the side once the enemy is busy. I think the issue is send them in like I did was that they uh, they were completely alone. They were the only thing for the enemy to focus on. So they were the only thing that got focused on. So yes, not the most value there. But nevertheless, they did provide a very welcome distraction while I move my units up. Uh, 62 and 47 kills. Although interestingly, the one with less kills has way more damage value out of the two quattles. Uh, these guys both focus in on enemy artillery units. So one of them was focusing on the Hellstone rocket battery on the left side of the battlefield. And one of them was focusing on the Luminac of High Street, which I would guess is this guy since he has less kills but more damage value. As I said, I don't really like the animations. I don't feel like it allows them to hit units a lot. I mean, clearly they did a decent amount of damage, but it just doesn't look like it when they're in the battlefield. It might just be in my head. Okay, but nevertheless... I would bring them, honestly, just for the spells and the invisibility. Even if they couldn't attack anything at all in melee, I'd be completely fine with it because that stuff is too funny. 
Oh, the engine of the gods. Stegodon's here. 190 and 99 kills. 2,500 damage value. Oh, I can't even tell you how much I love using that ability. And honestly, the opposite of this army, which uh, would be using these Soros Old Blood and these Gink Priest, can get a third engine of the gods. And it is just ridiculous. The amount of just raw dog damage and ability power that you can send out. You can pretty much kill the enemies without ever actually engaging them in melee, which is, is just hilarious. Uh, but... I, I can't recommend these guys enough. Yes, they don't have the same range as the artillery piece Stegodons. These guys are absolutely the best choice for this army. If you are focusing more on long range troops, then of course, go for the other artillery dinosaurs. But for this army composition, the engine of the gods, they are beautiful for me. Uh, the two Dread Saurians, 58 and 75 kills. Not the most damage value, but again, they were swarming into. It's not swarming. They were going into the swarm of the enemy great swords, So they were mostly picking up, you know, single end state kills on, you know, a great sword, which is worth... What, what, what are they worth per entity? Probably like 40 gold or something. So, you know, 58 kills, 98. That's, that sounds about right. It's... All right, they're cool, okay? They look cool and they do good damage throughout the entire battle. And to be honest, the only reason why they probably don't have more damage is because everyone else was just taking out these key tags before they could even get there. Uh, the Salamander Hunting Packs with 55 and 77 kills. Very, very nice. 55 and 77. I do like how that looks. Uh, 836 and 616 damage value. Again, they were focusing on the enemy ranged units. So, of course, not the most damage value. But nevertheless, so kills are very, very valuable because they didn't get to use that armor. Uh, the Feral Troglodons, of course, they have a much higher armor piercing damage and we're focusing on single entities. So, of course, they're going to have a lot higher damage value, even if they have less kills. So, 49 and 21 kills, but 1900 and 1200 damage value because they were focusing. I believe one of them was focusing on the Luminar called the Steam Tank, and the one was focused on the Demogriff Knights Halberds. So, of course, they're going to get a very, very, very nice damage value there. So, yes, I believe that wraps everything up. Thank you very much for watching. If you did enjoy this army composition, then definitely be sure to leave a like. And if you want to see more army compositions and videos on Total War Warmer 2, and of course, Warmer 3 when it comes out, then be sure to subscribe to the channel. I would appreciate it oh so much. And of course, don't forget to leave your army composition down in the comments below. I'd like to take this time to thank all supporters of the channel, in particular, Kobe Said So and It's Your Boy LC, for their fantastic support at the Unclean Ones tier. One more time, thank you so very much for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Dounders, and I will see you next turn.